Hello, everyone. Welcome here to uh, Agree or Disagree, the podcast, Hockey Edition. This is Kevin Olenek. Uh, of course, you can follow me at KVOLE and subscribe to all podcasts on Apple and Spotify and wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow Sean at Beardy Canuckle 3 and Tyler at T Noble. Uh, this is part two of our uh, weekly podcast. Sean and I had a chance to catch up with Cam Robinson uh, on the NHL draft. So this is our uh, edition with that. So have a listen and enjoy, and we will talk to you next week. Bye for now. So we are less than a month away from the NHL draft. The debate at the top continues. Is it Kako? Is it Jack? Uh, The questions also continue on who the Canucks will pick at number 10, or if they even should pick at number 10, or will they move up? Or are teams going to move down? Our guest today is going to help us navigate that. He is Canucks prospect and draft Allergers prospect, Dobbers prospect. You can also hear him as one of the co-hosts with Sat Shaw and Ryan Beach on Sportsnet 650's Prospect Center. Central, sorry, not Prospect Center. Fantasy Hockey at Dauber Hockey as well. It's Cam Robinson joining us today. How's it going, Cam? Uh, I'm doing well. How are you doing, boys? Great. Sean, of course, is with us as well. And I guess I want to start my – I think we should start at the top. We'll get into the Canucks philosophy here in a little bit. But I know that you have said that you are flipping the coin a little bit between Capo and Jack Hughes. Uh, in your mind, uh, is, this a, is this something that everyone is going to ha- – depends on everybody's perspective – how close is it really between Jack and Capo, and how much of this is a bit of a smokescreen? Uh, no, yeah, it, it is razor thin. And, you know, all season long, I, I usually do a, a prelim rankings uh, in August following the, the last draft, and, you know, it was Hughes and Capo at 1-2 when I did that last year. And it didn't change for the entirety of the season. And as of my last public uh, published rankings there, you know, six, seven weeks ago, it was still Jack and, and Capo 1-2 like that. Uh, I've gone back, so uh, usually when when most junior seasons are ending or winding down, um, I still, you know, I'll be watching the playoff hockey and the Mem Cup and things like that, but I, I really go back and I try to dig through my notes, I dig through some of the tape, I go back, I rewatch games, and I try to just get a, a deeper understanding of some players, and, and naturally I'll do that for some of the guys at the top of the draft, especially this year where some of the separation is so kind of minute, um, and then I'll do that on some other interesting prospects down the line that I feel maybe I haven't got a uh, a deep enough understanding on. I haven't had enough views and et cetera. And uh, so, so Capo Caco is one of the players that I've seen Jack Hughes uh, dozens of times. I don't, I don't even know how many times live and, uh, and obviously a ton on film too. And so I, I hadn't seen Caco as much and I wanted to go back and, you know, I'd still seen him probably 20, 30 times maybe, but I want to go back and really kind of dive into that. And uh, his play at the, at the world championships, the way he is just physically ready to be an NHL player immediately, um, the, the developmental curve is really, really trending in the right direction. And it's, and I like to see that. Um, I'm not saying that Jack Hughes isn't, but I think that he's been so good for so long that it's difficult for him to, to maintain that pace of rapid acceleration. Um, so at this point, you know, I, I'm staring at my, my working list and I've got Kako at number one. I've got Hughes at number two. I might wake up in the morning and flip flop that again. I reserve that right. Um, and we'll see where I land where I, uh, when I publish about a week before the actual draft. Uh, is this for for the Devils and the Rangers perspective? Is this going to be about style, or is it? Are you of the belief that the Rangers are the winners either way? If the Devils take Kako, the the Rangers win with Jack either way, or is this about? Is this is there a better fit for one or the other? I think there probably is. I think that that Hughes probably fits in a little better with New Jersey. Um, but but realistically, like you said, you know the Rangers. There's no sweeter spot in the draft because they're going to get a first overall talent at number two, and I and I truly believe that. And so they get to they get to roll up to the draft with no worries until their second first rounder there. And because they have the two first round picks too, is that they're going to hit a home run with number one. They can go out and get a little crazy with that second one. Maybe they move it. Maybe they slide back and get a whole bunch of seconds or they get a prospect they like right now that's already a little more developed. Or maybe they take a take a cut on a kid like Arthur Kaliev if he's sitting there, you know, take a swing on a high upside guy because you've already got 
you've got money in the bank with that first pick already. Um, so they, they've got the sweetest spot in the draft. But, you know, I think that Kako slides in well with the Rangers. And I think that a lot of Rangers fans are hoping that he's sitting there at number two is because, you know, they've got Leas Anderson and they got Philip Heedle, uh, you know, as their top two center prospects. And they got Mika Zibinijad, who's, I don't know, 26 or something like that and just had a 70-point season. So they're they're pretty well set down the middle at this moment. Um, they got Vitaly Kravtsov coming in. So Kako sliding in on the right side with this team, it's – it really kind of changes the dynamic altogether. Sure, they'll take Jack Hughes and they'll they'll make things work. And you know, maybe Leas Anderson becomes a third line center, um, or, or maybe Hughes starts out on the wing and, and works around like that. So uh, I do think that that uh, Hughes to New Jersey is. I believe that's probably likely what's going to happen. And I think that is a bit of the fit and that it's just razor thin and that he is such an elite player that it, there's no problem with him going first overall. And, and, uh, but it is fun to, to kind of pause it. What, what, uh, what could be if Kako lands in, uh, in New Jersey? Hmm. Sean, you have a question? Um, in regards to the Canucks in the number 10 spot, there's been a lot of talk lately that, um, Jim Benning and, uh, is looking for defense, and um, the the big name right now is Philip Broberg, and there's a there's, he's quite divisive because there's there's uh, scouts that think he's got the high upside, and uh, others that think his um, hockey sense will uh, will hold him back. Uh, what what are your thoughts on on Broberg? So it's this it's interesting for me too because. There are, like you said, there are some scouts out there who, who feel like this guy's a top five, top ten talent anyways. Uh, you know, I've heard some guys that say that you know, he, he could push Bull Byron for the best he out of this crop. And what really uh, kind of brings kind of an internal challenge for me is that some of these guys that are saying that and some of the guys I've talked to, some NHL scouts, I really respect and, and I and I believe in, in what they say. And I know their, their records speak for themselves, but... Personally, I, I, I don't see it myself. And in years past, when I maybe wasn't so confident in my own assessment abilities as I was coming up a little bit more, I would have hedged towards what these experienced uh, scouts are saying. And I would have been like, you know what? They see something I'm not seeing. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to elevate him up my, my board regardless of what I feel. And uh, I feel like maybe the, it's the white hair coming in the beard here prematurely that I, I, I'm a little more mature. I'm a little more confident in that. And, you know, for me, he's a guy that's probably going to be sitting there in the late teens. Maybe he's going to be sitting there in the 20s on my board when I finally publish too because – the more I watch him, I love the physical tools. There's no denying it. The kid's 6'3", and he can skate like the wind. And when you can do that, that's going to afford you a lot of opportunities. Uh, on the power play, it's going to give coaches – the coaches, uh, you know, they're going to see that, and they're going to drool too, and they're going to want him to succeed. But I put a lot of stock in, in a player's IQ and their ability to process the plays coming at them and the plays developing in front of them. And that's something that he really struggles at. And if, out of all the skills out there – skating, puck skills, everything, defensive, it's processing ability and and can you think the game that is the most difficult to teach and to learn and uh, there's been too many cases of players that that have those raw tools and you'd be like, oh my goodness, if they put this all together and then they don't put it all together. And and I'm of the opinion that I think Broberg has the, the skills, the physical skills to be an NHL defenseman, but I don't see him being a high impact guy. And so, you know, I, I would not be a big fan of them taking him at 10. Is he is he in your mind top three or bottom three, you know, going forward? Is he a t- one two three or a four five six? Yeah, no, I, I see him as being a guy that probably complements a, a bottom pairing. Maybe he's up there as a, as a as a four, you know, uh, not driving it as his line. And by driving it, I mean he'll probably be driving it with his legs, but he's not anchoring a second pairing. Um, you know, and, and I. I I never like to put ceilings on players either. And so I, I obviously he's going to be a first line talent. So that's not to say that maybe he is the one who, who develops it. He is fairly young for this crop. Um, you know, he, he doesn't turn 18 for another month or so. Uh, maybe, maybe it does all come together for him when he turns 20 or 21 and, and he begins to think the game a little bit better and he's able to, his hands can catch up to his feet and he could be a top pairing guy. I'm not saying that that's impossible, but in my opinion, I feel like he's more of a, a bottom pairing, maybe kind of a contributor on a second pairing guy. Um, out of the, 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 there's like three other defensemen, uh, Soderstrom, Thomas Harley and uh, Ville Hainola that uh, are getting a little bit of uh, play in that uh, 10 through 15 range uh, by some. Are there any of those three that uh, you would pick ahead of Broberg? 
Yeah, and don't forget Mort Sider either, the German kid. Uh, to be honest with you, I would have all of them in front of Broberg, and I will on my final board too. Um, you know, maybe maybe don't hold me that to the exact. I might fudge a little bit, but at, at this moment, I, I like I like Billy Hanel. I think he's a very safe player. I think if we're talking about guys that can play in a second pairing role and, and be impactful defensively as well, I think Hanel is going to fit that really really nicely. He does have some offensive upside. I really like the way he skates too. It's creative. He takes kind of sharp lines. Uh, Cam York. A lot of people are saying that you know he, he's put up the big points because he's played on a powerhouse NDTP squad, and they're not wrong. But he's very mobile. He's very calm. I like the way he sees the game. He's a great skater. Another kid I think has that kind of second pairing upside. Thomas Harley's probably maybe the most interesting of this group because he's very young for this this class. He's less than you know three weeks away from being in the 2020 group, um, and he's he's a play driver. He he can use those feet. Uh, he can still make some questionable decisions, and I, I do kind of chalk that up a little bit to immaturity for his game because it has accelerated so quickly the last you know. 10, 12 months. Um, so he's a guy with the frame, the way he can skate, uh, the way he can exhibit some of those high skill plays uh, that he's one of these guys that I could see being, you know, turning out to be a top pairing uh, or a top power play guy, maybe, and, and maybe contribute as a number two, number three, if things go right. Um, Mort Sider, I've really liked him all year. It took me a while to, to feel comfortable with the views that I had on him because, you know, early on I was going and checking in the DEL and he was getting a healthy scratch or he was playing limited minutes and, and as the season wore on, uh, the training wheels came off and his his play came out. And I've said this a few times now on air is that he's he's kind of this piece of clay just waiting to be molded into a work of art. So a six foot four right shot defenseman who can skate, who likes to jump up into the rush and actually does it very well, very timely. Um, I think there's a lot of upside for this kid. He might be the number two guy on my board for the defenseman. Uh, and then Victor Soderstrom, you know, he's like walking around with a bike helmet on. It's safety first. This, kid, this kid's going to be an NHLer. He's going to be someone who's going to impact the game in a lot of different ways. I don't see him as, as having the offensive ability to be on a top uh, power play unit, but I think maybe he can contribute on a second unit. He can generate chances. He can get the puck out of his zone. The zone exit rate is going to be very high with the ability to, to make that outlet pass and to skate it out. So uh, he's an interesting one too, and because he is so – I'd say he's, he's good across the board and especially defensively. And he's a right hand shot that, you know, there's a very strong chance that he's the second one off the board on draft day. So there's, there's a lot of options. And to be honest with you, I'd probably take them all over Broberg. So where, where are you on Bo and Byram? Are you one that if the, if he's at 10, he's a no brainer for the Canucks or are you at one that it should be thinking best player available? If he's there at 10, he's definitely the best player available for sure. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. There's, I, I realistically do not see him going past five. I think he's gone by, before five anyways, but if he's there, LA's sprinting up to the stage to grab him. So, Bone Byram, he's an explosive player. Um, you know, he, he does have some things that he needs to work on in the defensive end and to, to maybe take take onus on the play to, to really be the dictator of, uh, of things on the defensive end too. But, you know, he has that in spades on the offensive side of the puck and a uh, tremendous skater, got the great shot, got the great vision, heads always up. He's creating, uh, he rarely has an off night. He, he's a, he's the only guy in this group that I comfortably uh, project as having top pairing, top PP upside. And, uh, and I think he will get there too. So no, he's uh, he won't be there at 10, but if he was, you'd, you know, knock over your grandma to go grab him. Okay, if you were the Canucks, if he passes Chicago, which is is debatable and depending on the mock draft, um, do you is it worth it to take a run at trying to see if you can grab him? Yeah, I've heard a couple of things. I've heard that that Chicago is interested in sliding back at three because they know they're going to get a nice player if they slide back two or three spots. Um, I don't think it makes a lot of sense for Vancouver to do something like that, to move up to three, to move up to four for Colorado. Number four is found money. So they could be, they could be the wild card in this draft is that, you know, they're going to get a tremendous player at four. If they keep that pick, they could move that pick for a now player to really impact a young up and coming team. That's dangerous already. Um, so, you know, maybe they're open to, to doing something with that pick too, but Vancouver doesn't have the assets. They just don't have the assets to do it. The only thing that's going to entice a team and it's not going to work for Colorado uh, maybe it works for Chicago is to give up an unprotected 2020 first because that next year's draft class is, is pretty ridiculous. And, uh, and for Vancouver to give up an unprotected one, that's one Elias Pettersson injury away from being a, you know, a top five pick in a, in a really, really strong class. So I, I think that would be silly for Vancouver to do. 
I know that they want to make a splash as the, as the host of the draft. Um, I would really, I'd caution against it. So I think that, you know, unless you're willing to trade Brock Besser, unless you're willing to trade Bo Horvat, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to really substantially move up this draft board, even with attaching that 10th overall pick to it. So, so for, for me, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You need to have a ton of assets to make a deal like that. And it needs to make sense for the other team. And I don't think Vancouver has that. But you are projecting Byron to be on in a lineup next year, like in 2019-20. You, no, I'm I'm not. No, I I think that he goes back to the Giants. Um, yeah. I think that there's a there's a chance that he does stay in the NHL. That he could show up at camp and be one of these guys that that makes the team at a camp. But you know, he's he's another one. He's still 17. He won't turn 18 for a few months, a couple months now. Um, and like I was talking about defensively, I think that there are some things that he can clean up. Ideally, this kid would be playing in the AHL next year, but we all know the CHL NHL agreement prohibits that. Yeah. Uh, he's not going to go to Europe. Um, so, you know, I think he could be, I think he could be in the NHL. I don't think he would be because Chicago has a lot of defensemen already. Um, and they have some nice ones coming up too. And then Colorado also has a a deep blue line with some young kids on it and they're not in any position to really have to rush him. So, um, maybe he goes to LA and he cracks that lineup. Um, but otherwise I think he goes back to Vancouver. He plays for the giants for another year and then he comes up and he, he stays up. Uh, Sean, did you have a question or? Um, this, uh, Pod Colson is one player that uh, is very, is, seems to be dropping in a lot of rankings and mock drafts. Um, and a lot, a lot of it, I, I think is because he hasn't played enough over this past season and hasn't been able to show the high end offensive skill that you would want in a top 10 pick. Um, where do you see him ending up, uh, uh come June? Yeah, I'm not a big mock draft guy. Um, I, I will maybe do one just because it gets a lot of clicks and it gets a lot of love. But um, I, I think that the kind of doom and gloom around Pod Colson for the last little bit, especially after the U18s, is, is a little overstated. And I was like everyone else. I expected and I hoped that he was going to show up big internationally because that's what this kid does. You know, he started his campaign at the Halenka where he led that tournament in scoring with 11 points. He had eight goals in five games. Um, you know, he went back and then he, that's when his season kind of fractured a little bit is that he played, you know, a dozen games in the MHL, which is the top junior league in Russia. He played a dozen games in the VHL, which is, you know, the AHL equivalent in Russia, the second professional league. You know, he played a handful of games in the KHL. He was jumping around all over the place on the international team. Um, And that's where I feel like he didn't get his footing underneath him. So he played fine in the MHL, but he didn't put up the big gaudy numbers. He actually looked really good in the VHL, which is a, it's a really dirty league. It's not fun to watch. It's, it's, it's kind of clutch and grab. It's got a lot of, a lot of tight checking action in it. And, you know, he still put up a few points in, in, you know, 14 games or so. Um, And then in the KHL, he saw no ice, which, which 17 year olds never do. Uh, But then he goes, uh, he goes out to the world junior a tournament. And again, he's arguably the best player at that tournament. Him and Bobby Brink were were the top guys there. And so at the U18s, I expected him to have a nice one. And, you know, he was okay. Um, I thought he focused a lot on, on the defensive side of things. And that's a a big part of his game. He's a very responsible player. Um, He, he plays a, he's, he's, he plays really a competitive game that he wants the puck. He wants to be the best at everything. And I think that it goes a little too far defensively sometimes where he, he never wants to be on the wrong side of things. And so he won't not even cheat, but he won't really put offense as his first priority at times. And, and so that kind of leads to him having some muted point totals. And that's what we've seen is his outside of a couple of those tournaments, his point totals haven't been there, but a couple of things I like about him. He's smart. Okay, he's very smart, and we see that he sees the play, and and even with you know some of the, the knock on him is a bit that his head's down sometimes, but I think that's going to change a little bit too with some skill coaches. But he's smart; he makes the right decisions, especially defensively, and he has great skating, and he has really nice puck skills. So I think that when we talk about players like can he put it all together, I would much rather take a swing on Vasily Podkolzin putting it all together than a player like Philip Broberg, who has shown me that he can keep his head up, but he just doesn't make that right decision. Uh, where I think Pod Colson is that if he starts to cheat and starts to lean and starts to get, you know, pure offensive zone deployments and teams are like, you know what, we want you to be a point per game player, like go ahead, go get it, that he's going to be a guy that it's a good bet. Now, you know, we've all heard it. He wants to play in the KHL for two more years or two years, I should say. Um, he has that contract. He's not going to buy out of it. That's not a big deal. Uh, 
you know, if you're drafting a kid right now in the seven or 10 hole and you want him to play on your roster the next season, you know, you're, you're probably taking a deep swing. So let him stay in Russia and develop. Um, you know, he, he's playing with St. Petersburg. And, and so that's the, the concern is that they're a good team and that they're going to, you know, woo him into loving it. And, and he'll, he'll be like Capra's off and he maybe won't come over till he's 22 or maybe won't come over at all. Is that like, how often does that, that happen? Vitaly Kravtsov just went around one last year. He's coming over immediately, right? It takes one year. So maybe you're waiting two years on Pod Colson, but he's a risk I think that's worthy of a selection in the top 10. And and it's not like the KHL is a terrible league. He will develop. Uh, so, yeah, I don't see that being a hurt really as well. Uh, it, within that, the, I mean, we talked about Bo and Byron. We talked about Pod Colson. Is there in that three to ten? Is there who who would be your favorite? Who's the guy other than Bowen Byram that you're like? I'm I'm really high on this guy. And who's well, the guy, I, guy that's ahead. getting a little over bit of an overrated play there? I mean, I, I think you know my favorite personally is Alex Turcott, and he he won't be there at ten. And so so you know I, I think for realistic guys. Um, Trevor Zegras is a player that I really, really like, and he's he's a, he's creative, he's offensive, uh, great puck skills, great vision, he's confident the plays that he makes. I would like to see him be able to kind of ramp up the game when things get a little faster, when things get a little tighter, that he's he's able to elevate up with that. He likes to slow the play down at times a little bit, and that doesn't really mesh with some of these games, you know, in, in high pressure situations and playoffs and in, in metal rounds and things like that, he tends to get a little more quiet. Um, not all the time, but he is a pass first player too, so that everything kind of tightens up. There's less scoring chances. So obviously a, a creative player like that. And I think he's probably a winger, but I do really like Trevor Zegers. Um, And then, you know, we, we can talk about Cole Caulfield. I think there's a chance that he's there at 10. I think there's a chance that Vancouver would pass on him too, but man, he's, he's got that shot that can bring you out of your seat. Um, but you know, I've talked about it a couple of times too, is Matt Boldy. Um, again, another player that I wouldn't be surprised if Vancouver passed on if he was still sitting there at 10, but he's, he's got a really nice upside as a complete winger that can shoot the puck. He can set up players. He's great defensively. And that's something that he's really worked on and focused on the last year and a half. Uh, good on the PK. He's a leader, great power play. Uh, he's just an all around guy, but he plays the wing and he, he's not explosive skater. And I think Vancouver really wants to go with speed there. Um, so for me, you know, we're talking the top of the class that I'd love to see them grab a Dylan Cousins even too. So I can just talk about all these guys in the top 10 because I, I really love them all. Um, but for Vancouver, who I think they're going to go with is a speed driven player up front. And I know that there's, there has been the talk of them going defense first, and but I think that's a bit of a smoke screen. And uh, I think they will go with a forward, granted, you know, uh, assuming that there is one there that ha- that has a lot of speed and a lot of awareness because that's what they're really targeting. I, when when you said they were passing on some of these guys, I, I sort of had a little bit of a red flag. Like you're passing on a Boldy, which in, in some mock drafts is in a top eight position. Like a guy like Boldy and a back guy like Zegers. What like other than, like a for a Canucks fan that is concerned about that passing on someone like because there is the past history. As an example, Matthew Kachuk. Uh, alleviate their fears a little bit in passing like someone on a Matthew Boldy. Like what is, what is passable about him? Yeah. Just like I said, there's a couple of things. So, you know, I think he would fit in well with their prospect pipeline because he, he's a winger and they don't have any, any really elite wingers. They don't have any real high upside wingers whatsoever in the system coming up. Obviously they have Brock Besser and that's it in the NHL. So I think that he would make sense positionally uh, but I really feel like they're looking for a player that has a lot of speed, and Boldy doesn't have that. So he's a fine skater. His two-step quickness needs work. Um, he's another one that plays with pace in the sense that he slows things down to his pace when he can. Um, actually, so he doesn't really play with a ton of pace speed-wise. Um, I think they're really looking at some of these Western kids. So if Dylan Cousins is there, a big, strong center who who makes the right decision most of the time and skates like the wind, uh, Alex Newhook. I think that he's he's kind of the guy that I've got a lot of a lot of my spidey uh, senses are tingling. That if he's there at ten, I believe that Alex Newhook is their guy. Um, he's another one, really strong defensive player that he doesn't get enough credit for that. But offensively too, he's got dangerous hands. He's got the good hockey sense, and then again, speed, speed, speed. He can play the middle of the ice. He could shift over to the wing as well. You know, so passing on a guy like Matt Boldy, 
passing on a kid like Cole Caulfield, which might be harder to do at this point because he has just proven that, you know, put him with an intelligent center like Jack Hughes. And they got, they have a couple of really smart centers in Vancouver uh, is that he could, he could be a dynamic finisher, but uh, you know, there's Peyton Krebs, even too, who might have a lower offensive ceiling is a, is a very, very good skater. And I think that they're going to, they're going to make that a priority because it's a fast game and they know it. And at this point, they're not an overly fast team. And I think that they need to, mm. to generate that more up front too. And their pipeline doesn't have a ton of speed coming up either. Mm. Fair. Sean, did you have a... Yeah, I, I quite like uh, Peyton Krebs. I I think in terms of what he brings just all around, it, it reminds me a lot of like a lot of both Orvat. Um, in terms of that aspect with his leadership and his willingness to work both sides of the puck. And uh, if the, if he's available there, I really, at, at 10 and, and like you said, all like the, 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 the speed guys, uh, super speed and skill guys are gone. I think that uh, that would be a fantastic pick. Um, and that's just something I've noticed with, with the Canucks picks over the last couple of years is that they, they're definitely players that um, seem to be like just hockey nerds and love to work hard and, and it all constantly look to improve and, and look at how the game goes and, and, and all that. And I really think that's something that Krebs brings. And as when you were talking about Pod Coles and that, I think that, uh, that, that matches it as well. Yeah, no, you're, I think you're absolutely right. And Peyton Krebs, he's, he's a really hard one for me to, to lock into a spot because um, he's another kid that I've watched an awful lot of the last couple of seasons. And, you know, he is. He, he's a strong two-way player. He does. He's always been a leader on, on every team he's played on. So he, he's one of these guys that, you know, puts the team on his back. And he definitely did that on a, just a god-awful Kootenai team uh, the last couple of seasons. And it's been tough for him. But you know, I could I could put this guy at number six and feel good about it, and I could see him going that early as well too. And I, I think a team could fall in love with his skill set and the whole package there. And then at the same time, you know, I could I could slide him in at number twelve and 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 justify that too because I don't think he has as the high end offensive ceiling. So I feel like he he's he's going to be an NHL player. I think he's going to be at very least an energy line player. So a top nine guy, I think that he should be a top six player. Um, but I don't see him as having, you know, 75 point upside or anything beyond that. So, you know, to, to put him ahead of a guy like Caulfield who could go out there and score 40 goals and he might only get 25 assists, but you know, that's a hell of a season or, or a player like Pod Colson or Zegris or, or, or new hook that I think they have their offensive games are, are more refined. They're more developed and I project them being better at the next level. And so it's, it's a difficult one because I think he's a very safe pick. I would be fine with Vancouver taking him at 10. I think he'd be a very nice addition to their, their pipeline. He would immediately be their top center prospect, their top prospect in general, as we graduate Quinn Hughes here. Um, And so I, I think he's fine. I've kind of expanded this list is that I felt that number three to number 10 for much of the season was a single tier and that were completely interchangeable. I think that's now 12 deep. And that's because New Hook and Caulfield have forced their way into that. And so, you know, honestly, on draft day, I really think that Byram and Turcotte are going 3-4 in, you know, whatever order. And then we're looking at 5-12. to 12. It's going to be nuts. And and every single year we see a team reach on a player. And maybe that's Broberg this year. Um, you know, maybe it's Kaliev. Maybe someone gets crazy and they really fall in love with Phil Tomasino. And that just means that there's going to be another option available for Vancouver at 10. And so they're going to have their pick of a few really nice players from that group. And and unless they're the ones that get crazy and go off the board, I think they're going to grab themselves a good one. Can, can we just expand? Because I'm, interest, I'm interested in Cole Caulfield because there's the idea of 40 goals. And just I, I think that there's going to be some appeal with him, rightly or wrongly. Uh, what are your kind of expanding your little bit of what he is like to use what you did on uh, Sportsnet Central? What's the good things and what is kind of his weakness of, of Cole Caulfield? Yeah, the good is obvious. He 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 knows how to score, and uh, and you know I I do put that little asterisk next to his name because he has got to live with Jack Hughes in all situations this past season, and it. <laughs> it helped him get 70 odd goals throughout his year, which is, you know, pretty insane to think of. But uh, so, you know, if he was playing in the OHL, I think he would have scored 50. So, you know, maybe even, maybe even more because he's that good and he would have just risen immediately to the top line wherever he's going to play in the junior level. Now moving up, he's five foot six and three quarters. 
that alone is going to be prohibitive. I'm not, I'm not so big on being like, you know, he's five foot six or five foot seven. He's not going to be a player because I, I don't believe that's the case anymore. Um, my uncle was actually drafted, uh, you know, a hundred years ago and he was five foot six and he showed up to camp the next year and they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then it's like they drafted the wrong guy or they thought he was going to put on six inches before camp and immediately got cut. Uh, that's not the league we're playing in anymore. Uh, I think he can succeed, but at five foot six, five foot seven, I want you to be speedy. I want you to be elusive. I need you to get to those spots and be able to project that, hey, he's going to get to those soft areas. He's going to be able to cut into that home plate zone and, and be able to do the things that he does at the junior level, and that's finish. Um, so my, my, my only hesitation is, is that will he be elusive? Will he be quick enough to get to the areas that he needs to? Um, now, skating and acceleration and that two-step quickness is a trait that can be developed and at this point i feel that he's fine he's fine at it if he was six foot i wouldn't even be talking about it i'd say that he's a good skater Uh, but he is five foot seven and so they need to be better than good they need to be johnny goodrow they need to be cam atkinson you need to be a dynamic skater if you want to succeed at that level and so i need that to happen i think he's going to be a tremendous college player he's going to go to wisconsin next year and he's probably going to pop 30 plus goals we haven't seen that since kyle connor a few years ago it doesn't happen too often for freshmen um, and then, you know, he's probably a two year college player and then we're going to see what we got, uh, because he, those, these next two seasons coming up for him and, in, and his off season training, it's going to tell us a lot about what type of player he's going to be in the NHL, because these are huge developmental years. And if he can get that quickness, um, it's going to be big. And then finally, obviously where he goes. So does he go to Edmonton at eight? And do they gift wrap him a spot next to dry saddle and Rick David as his center? Because if they do, you know, he's not going to have to work as hard to get to those areas mm-hmm. because everyone's going to be keying in on the center and he's going to find the soft spot and he's going to finish. And so where he lands is going to impact this greatly. You know, you end up in LA and obviously I'll say Kopitar is a, a tremendous centerman, but you know, they don't have a lot coming up other than Rasmus Kapari. And uh, you know, they're not at the same level as what he's been, he's been dealing with the last couple of seasons. So very, very interesting player. He will be in my top 10 come draft uh, day. Uh, and I think he goes even before that. I, I see him probably not making it past eight. Wow. Interesting. Uh, Sean? Um, yeah. I, if, uh, with um, the Canucks second round pick, there's there's a lot of um, players that I was looking at. Uh, Braden Tracy was one, but it looks like he's popping up into the top, into the first round. Uh, where – is there anyone in that uh, in that forty range that you would be looking looking at for the Canucks? Yeah, there's a whole heck of a lot of players in that zone, and and so this is where the whole you know do you draft for positional need or do you draft the best player available comes really comes into play. Is that with your first round pick, take the best player, regardless. Okay, go ahead. If it's a goalie, go ahead, take him. If he's clearly the best player, go get that player. Now we're looking at pick 40. Go ahead and pick for need if you want to. Because these guys, you can, there's a little bit, there's some warts on all of them. You can, you can kind of argue that one of these guys sitting there at pick 40 could be there at 80. Or maybe he should have gone at 25. And you can make that justification on how you've scouted him, how your staff has seen this player. Um, and so there's a ton of players. And we won't know, obviously, until draft day. There's going to be some sliders. Maybe Patrick Pistola, uh, a Finnish kid, is going to be sitting there. And he's clearly the best player available. And you're like, shoot. I wanted to go defenseman here, but I'm going to go ahead and take this because um, if there's a glaringly obvious best player who's slid, go ahead and take him. But otherwise, you know, look for some look for something that you need. And for the Canucks, they need unless they go ahead and reach in the first round, they're going to need a defensive prospect or three. And so, you know, there's a few of them. I really like Tobias Bornfot. Um, he's a left shot guy. He played in the Super League this year. He's mobile. He's smart. He's always internationally for Sweden playing on their top power play unit uh, ahead of guys like Victor Soderstrom and Philip Broberg. Um, so he's one of these guys that he's made a habit of, of just the coaching staff feels that he's the best complement to their top power play unit, which is pretty deadly in Sweden these days. Um, you know, there's there's uh, Ryan Johnson, another kid I really like, a left shot D, very, very mobile. He's smart. He's a two-way guy. Hasn't gotten nearly as much love this year playing in the USHL, but I think he's a player that should be going in the top 50 and for my money around 35 there too. Um, if, we're, if we're sticking with D, I think Lassie Thompson makes a lot of sense. Coming out of the Western League, right shot D, He's a little bit older for this crop, so you can kind of see physically and, and mentally where he's going to be probably sooner. Um, yeah, again, 
Bobel has a big, big shot. Really nice release on this kid. So he's going to be a power play, probably a second power play unit guy if things go well. Um, really like it, the way he's developed over the last 18 months sort of thing. So I think Lassie Thompson's an interesting kid. Uh, Jordan Spence out of the queue, a right shot guy, more offensive. Uh, a little bit smaller, 5'10", 165. And I know the Canucks have some small guys back there. But, you know, Anthony Honka, another guy you can take a big swing on if you want to get a mobile offensive right shot D in the system. So there's a lot of options that are going to be sitting there. And that's just talking about the defensemen. Again, at number 10, they're in a tier that unless they get crazy, they're going to get a good player. At 40, same thing. There's going to be a couple of sliders that you don't expect to be there on day two that maybe they're there at 40 or maybe they push some of these other guys that are in the low 30s down to 40. Um, that there's, there's going to be some really nice options. Now, as far as making those decisions, you talked a little bit about this uh, on on Prospect Central, but uh, kind of the influence of Judd Brackett, what are your – who? I guess in your opinion, who should be making this decision? Is this – something that you would trust Judd Brackett for, or is this something that Jim Benning, you feel that Jim Benning can make, or kind of what are your thoughts on the Canucks' philosophy around who they're picking at 10, 40, their draft picks, etc.? Yeah, I don't want to speak for Judd, and um, I know him a little bit, and he's a really good guy, and uh, I, I think that a, a lot of back padding goes on to him for some of these successful drafts, and I think that's well-earned. I think he's a very intelligent guy. Um, I think he's destined for bigger and greater things, too, um, but I, I think he would also say that, you know, it's it's not just him. It's the whole staff. And they get together and they feel that they're a unit and they get, you know, they dig their feet in, they get in the trenches there and they debate and they really kind of go to bat for certain players. And I think that that's what you want from your staff. You want guys that are passionate about certain players and that they're willing to go to the wall for them. And, you know, at the end of the day, if they get outvoted, so be it. Or they, you know, maybe they get the Trump card over top of them that, you know, the, the head scouts say, you know what, we're going to go this way. But, you know, this was close. Um I think that you should be giving, given the direction of, of these picks to the guys that have, have been there, who have seen them, who have had their, their boots on the ground at every game and watch these guys and really have a full understanding of who can do what and who projects where, then letting your GM who, and you know, no discredit to Jim Benning. He has, you know, he has a career as being a very, very strong scout and, you know, he's risen up the ranks because of it, similar to how I think Brackett will, the path he takes. Um, so he's a scout and he feels like he is a scout. And I know that. And, and he's not, he's not doing what he used to do. He's not sitting in the barns and, you know, with the shitty coffee and, and the, the freezing toes and watching these guys night in and night out. And, and I think that he probably respects that too. And he knows that he, he's been there. He's done that, that, you know, listen to the guys who know. And at the end of the day, it's going to be him who takes the heat. The GM is going to be front and center. If something goes right, he's going to get the back pad. If something goes wrong, he's going to get the ax. Um, but uh, I think you do need to lean on your staff and hopefully everyone's, you know, nearly on the same page and they can all agree with it. And what do you like in terms of philosophy? What are like, how has that changed over the years? Like, um, like from the Yolevi pick, which was a bit controversial to, of course, what we've seen from Pedersen and, of course, the Quinn Hughes. Like, what have you, what have you seen in terms of the progression of the Canucks draft philosophy? Yeah, I, I think that uh, early on we saw with JV there with for ten is that you know you wanted Benning wanted to put his mark on on that first pick. He was just coming in and. You know, he went for the kid who was big and he was talented and he and he was in the Western League and he scored 40 goals. And, he, you know, it's like this is a, this is a now NHL player. He's big, he's fast, and he's hard-hitting. And that's what we were looking at, right? 2013, Boston, Chicago, I believe, were in the cup final the year before. As we say, this is often a copycat league. And you see two big, fast teams gunning it out. And, uh, and you're like, that's what we need. And, you know, at the same time, Pertanen was widely expected to go in the top 10. My money, I wanted Willie Nylander. You know, a lot of people wanted Nick Ehlers. I was cool with either one. Didn't want Pertanen because I placed a lot of emphasis on processing speed. Um, so, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't love that. You know, then he goes out and he grabs Brock Besser in the 20s, in 2015. That's a great pick. And, you know, from all accounts, and I've, I've, I've heard some whispers from their camp is that, you know, they had Besser really high on their board. And uh, to get him in the 20s, that, that shows me that they, they were putting more of an emphasis on smart players too. And obviously he has the, the elite shot. Um, and then I think that, I think that there, it's an ever evolving thing is that they went for the draft for positional need with Ole Levy and they, I think they fell in love with his world junior championships, which was tremendous, but it was on a team where he was playing all his minutes with Puliarvi and Line and Ajo. And that's pretty dirty at a U20 level. And so it was just, I think 
I think they learned from that. And, uh, you know, uh, Jason Botchford and I had many, many conversations about this. He was adamant that he's like, they will not reach for a defenseman this year because they've learned their lesson from you, Levy. And you know what? At the end of the day, we can all kind of point the finger at them and be like, you know what? That wasn't a great pick with you, Levy. But all they can do is learn from their lesson. And so I, I'm taking that to heart. And I feel that talking about taking a D-man at 10 is maybe a slight possibility if all their top nine guys are off the board and they're really not in love with their 10th best you know, forward or ninth best forward that's sitting there. Maybe they go D, but I think it's a bit more spoke screen and that uh, you know they're going to let their scouts make the right decision and take the best player available. Sean? Um, but- yeah, I think I, I see, I've see. i seen the same thing in terms of them going smarter and with um, good skating skills because with Quinn Hughes and Elias Pet- Peterson, there's just been too much. To, they, it was, they, they've, had, they've had a little bit of luck in the last two drafts with those, fall, with those guys falling to them. Um, but in terms of, like, in terms of who they have in, in – the uh, in their uh, oh, cupboard right uh, right now, um, Tyler Madden is one that uh, I think was a was a big huge uh, Judd Brackett pick, and you know, he's making him look really good. What uh, what what made uh, 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 Madden really pop this past year? Uh, yeah, I, I think I think his game translated well. I think you're right. I believe that probably was a a, a bracket influence selection. Um, he he watched a lot of Madden out there, and he liked him. And you know, I spoke to him on draft day and 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 asked him about that pick because you know what, I, I had Madden. I think in, in the late '90s or even like you know one on one on one on my board, and he went 63 uh, to Vancouver and. And, you know, I liked a lot of the things that I saw from Madden in the first half of his USHL season. Uh, And then I didn't love some of the things I saw in the back half. And again, I'm limited, right? I don't get to see these guys every night. I only have so many hours in a day. And and so I'm sure Brackett and some of the East Coast guys had had more views on him. And he just said he loved the way he skates, he loved the way he competes. Um, he saw him, he envisioned him stepping into Northeastern and really taking on a large role with that team. And, you know, he wasn't wrong. So Madden stepped in the door with Northeastern and basically replaced Adam Gaudet, which are some big skates to fill, you know, uh, coming out of a Hobie Baker type season. And uh, he, he performed very, very well, especially kind of the middle two thirds of the season. I think that on the beginning, it was a, a touch slower. And then at the end, he slowed down a bit too. Um, but it's it's a tough league to play in, and I, I think that his season was very very strong, and he's elevated himself up the Canucks depth chart. He's he's really opened my eyes to maybe what his ceiling could be. I saw him as more of you know if things go the right way, he could be a third liner who could impact the game on the penalty kill. Uh, where now I think that you know he still has he has several steps to take, but that he could be a guy that could be uh, a top six winger uh, and kind of contribute in all sorts of special teams because I really love his tenacity. Um, he hounds that puck, especially in the offensive zone. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen him lift a stick and steal it, and then all of a sudden it's a quick shot on net, and it's, it doesn't matter the angles. Um, so he's he's a really he's a tenacious player, and he plays kind of like a pit bull out there, and I, I like that despite being uh, slightly undersized, and hopefully he can kind of develop in that frame and, and you know play in the NHL at you know 180 or something like that. So you're throwing 25, 30 pounds onto this kid's frame, and it, uh, it could be pretty uh, pretty fun for Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Well, we, we've talked a little bit about Jet Wu as well. Uh, where and he's he's going to be with the Hitman next year. Uh, how is that going to help him in your mind? And where what kind of what are your thoughts on what you're seeing from Jet Wu so far? Another kid, I really like the progression that we've seen from him. Um, he's he's again another player that I liked a lot of what I saw early on in the season, and that was part and parcel is that uh, early on in his draft eligible campaign, he was number one healthy and he kind of, because a couple other injuries impacted the the team um, when he was playing in Moose Jaw is that he got elevated up the lineup and started playing some top power play and started to play some top pairing minutes and he was putting up points and he was skating and he was obviously doing that, doing his thing out there. And then he got injured and he came back and his, his position on the team was kind of gone in that sense. And he became more of a secondary guy. And then the numbers dipped and, you know, he got another injury. And so it was just, it was a difficult year for him in the, in the second half. And so he slid out of my first round. He was more of uh, kind of in the forties for me. Um, and, uh, you know, they grabbed him early on day two. And, you know, again, I thought it was a touch of a reach, uh, but 
but they've, uh, you know, he's kind of proved me wrong in his development. He took a really nice step. Now, last year, he played all the fun minutes. Um, so he got all the top power play unit. He got a lot of offensive uh, deployment. Um, so he wasn't the number one D on that team. I would say Josh Brook was the Montreal uh, prospect. And so my expectation was that he was going to go to back to Moose John. He was going to be the guy because Josh Brook was elevating up to the AHL. And that was going to be the thing. Now he's off to Calgary. And I, I still think that he's going to be kind of playing those top pairing minutes as well. Uh, he'll he'll have a little bit of help on this team. And, and so you know, I, I'm hopeful that he's going to be a big time player for them, though. Mm-hmm. And I think that he will be a big time player on Team Canada. I, as long as he doesn't have a poor start, that he should probably play in a, a top mm-hmm. four role for that team. Maybe he's playing with Bowen Byram. They've had some history of playing together in the past. Um, on that team so I think it's gonna be a really interesting year for him he's probably gonna put up some gaudy point totals he'll have the international experience and then he's coming up to the AHL and because the right side of the Canucks depth chart is so shallow um, he's one that might not be uh, too much of a weight before you see him in a Canucks jersey you know even in a call-up situation cool uh, so we do thank you Cam for coming on where what what are you up to as the draft is coming up here if I go to few weeks away here uh kind of what are what can we look for you for the next uh, three to four weeks here oh yeah tons of content for sure um yeah we're, we're doing the we're doing the show and the podcast there on sports at 650 uh that that airs every saturday and then we get the pot up um you know i'll be doing a couple more deep dives for dauber prospects my usual ramblings on dauber hockey i've got uh, an exciting announcement coming out here in the next couple of days i'll save that though but uh, you guys can keep an eye out for that uh there's gonna be a lot there's gonna be not a ton of sleep and uh, and a lot of hockey stuff going on but i love this time of year so it's great cool well we thank you Papai after sean and tyler and i thanks for coming on uh thanks for taking some time uh, and uh Hopefully you do get some rest. Try to rest up a little bit, but uh, hope maybe we'll talk to you closer to the draft or even after the draft as well. Yeah, sounds good. I got a new baby coming in a few months, so I hope I get a little bit of sleep before then. Oh, congratulations, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Yeah. All right. Thanks.